Friday, August 8, 1969. A memorial service was held here at St. Andrews for four air crew who had been killed the previous Sunday, Monday night, August 3 and 4. The four crewmen who died, three Roman Catholics and one Jewish man, were Captain David or Donald Merriam of Kingston, a dual Canadian Swiss national, First Officer Raymond Levesque, 27 years of age, of Montreal, Flight Engineer Vincent Wakeling, 37 years of age, of Montreal, and Loadmaster Gary Libus, 29 years of age, from Toronto, originally from Sydney, Nova Scotia. Their plane was one of the Canair Relief planes, CFNAJ. The actual cause of the crash of the super constellation was never determined, but an explanation of sorts could be found in the fact that the aircraft flew into trees on the top of a hill, 15 kilometers off course. It was concluded that it was likely a false beacon and the pilot didn't catch it in time. A second memorial service was held on Thursday, August 28, 1969, in Mary, Queen of the World Cathedral in Montreal. It was the Montreal-based Nordair that had been the source of most of the personnel for Canair Relief. Many pilots, flight engineers, loadmasters were recruited from that company and they served for the entire 1969 off of the island of Seo Tome, flying at night into Biafra, into the second busiest airport on the continent of Africa. That second busiest airport was actually a widened piece of highway. And every night they received planes, the super constellations, the Canadian super constellations were the largest. Each could carry 20 tons of food and medicine. It was Nordair that took over the management of the flight operations in September of 1969 for the next four months. Back in Biafra, on the 5th of August, the day after the crash, the bodies of the four Canadians were taken to a place called Ihala and then buried in the Anglican cemetery at Uli. The funeral was seen, overseen by Reverend Sandy Somerville, Scottish missionary and a Roman Catholic priest. A day later, Stanley Burke, Canadian journalist, former CBC staffer, and Ken Davis, the chief operating officer of Canair Relief, flew the other airplane into the same destination, Uli Airport. At that time, 2,000 children a day were dying in Biafra. A week later, Hugh McCullum, the United Church Observer, of, and also Rosedale Presbyterian Church's minister, the Reverend Ian Mackay, chair of Canair Relief, flew into Biafra. The support of the Anglican Church in Canada, Oxfam, and Jewish Enterprise, uh, primarily through one Jewish gentleman, supported this airlift. From there, it spread across Canada, and people grabbed hold of this and became, I don't know what word to entranced or captivated by what was going on. Canadians wanted to do something. Can Air Relief was that avenue to provide assistance. Fast forward 53 or so years. What does one do in one's retirement? Many people here might be considering that issue. I thought I was just going to start reading books and curling up on my couch and doing nothing, except my telephone rang. 
And it was one of those telephone calls that you should perhaps wonder whether you should answer or not. I answered four and a half years ago, and it was Angela. And she said, could you help me for a couple of minutes? <laughs> well, four and a half years later, we will see a little bit of the film tonight that Angela has been working on. Angela Onorha is a new Canadian. She just became a Canadian citizen in 2022 with her husband and three children. They live in Waterloo. But in that time, she has not been sitting on her couch reading books like I wanted to be doing. She has been taking courses in film and in documentary film, and she has been producing this film. It is a remarkable slice of Nigerian history. It's a remarkable slice of Canadian history. And Angela was inspired by the story of her father-in-law, who went to a school in Nigeria called Hope Waddle named after an Irish-Scottish missionary. At that school, he met his chemistry teacher, who happened to be a Canadian Presbyterian missionary, Ron McGraw of St. Catharines. The two gentlemen knew one another at school, and when the war broke out, the father-in-law looked up Ron McGraw, who had decided to remain in Biafra, delivering the food aid, and the student joined the teacher and became a team assisting in distribution of medicine and food. Angela wanted to tell this story. She wanted to give back to her new adopted nation a slice of history that is most remarkable. And she has accomplished that. It hasn't been easy. She's put an awful lot of effort into it. I ended up, after that initial telephone call, of becoming a lead researcher and co-producer. And little did I know what that meant. But you know, after, on these credits that go on forever and ever at the end of every movie that you ever see, and you think, oh, will these ever finish? Thank God that there's a good musical score that I can tap to. Well, all of those credits are people that Angela worked with for the last four and a half years. She brought together a team of people that were captivated by this story. They wanted to be engaged and learn more about this slice of Canadian history. Angela worked with them, or they worked for her, with her, and she produced this documentary film. Much credit is given to the people who she brought together to produce this film. You won't see all the credits tonight. But know that when you do see the film, they go on for quite a while. It takes a lot of people to produce such a movie. Ron McGraw, the, one of the key people in the uh, production of this, passed away just a month and a half ago. He knew the film was coming, and he had played a key role in inspiring Angela to tell her story. Angela has poured a great deal of time and energy into this. It's her story, but it's also Canada's story. It captivated me. I lived there. I lived within driving distance, a four-hour driving distance uh, from Uli Airport. I lived there for 16 years. And I never thought of stopping and walking through the bush to find the one other aircraft that was abandoned there. I never stopped of thinking to go to the cemetery and visit the graves. And I so regret that I didn't do that. But I've been given this other opportunity to learn, and there are many books. Let me tell you, there are many books. Come to my study, there are many books. And it's great. It's fascinating. It is Canadian. It's also so Nigerian. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you tonight Angela Onoha, and when we have seen the trailer, to ask her then to come forward and she'll give a background, a little bit more about the film, and then Brian and Angela, I'm sure there'll be a great dialogue and a lot of good questions. How 
recorded one of Canada's finest hours of bravery, selflessness, and humanitarianism get left in the past and forgotten. Let's do a quick recap on that, shall we? Nigeria owes its existence to the partition of Africa at Berlin Conference in 1884-1885. They simply amalgamated the territory, not amalgamating the people. The British introduced divisive tendencies, what is called divide and rule. On the 6th of July, 1967, Nigeria went to war on itself. I know you have seen a lizard. It is what they look like. They look ugly. The situation became critical. People were dying in shocking numbers. 2,000 kids, can you imagine, every day dying, it was awful. So we, we had to do something. We couldn't stand by idly. They were suffering from a protein deficiency a disease called Kwashiorkor. And Vietnam and Biafra also were the two first television wars in history. Joint Church Aid International was created. Can Air Relief was a part of a much larger mission known as Joint Church Aid, fondly called Jesus Christ Airlines. They had to fly at night. It was either that or get shot down by the Nigerian forces. Just over 50 years ago, a group of people came together and pulled off the largest non-governmental war relief efforts in history. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. <sighs> Thank you, Rick. You have been my partner in crime. <laughs> and yes, I told him it was just for a few minutes, but <laughs> it went on for more than a few minutes. And um, I, I feel honored to have been chosen to tell the story. And I say chosen because when I talk about how this story chose me, it sounds like a crazy person's story. My father-in-law came to visit us after we had just moved here. I moved here eight years ago with my family after my son was diagnosed with autism spectrum, autism disorder. And um, it was, it was I, I guess it was easier for us to move here because I did, you know, want somewhere where my, my family could adapt and grow. And besides the fact that my kids were born here, um, my, my husband wanted us to come here. And coming here was like finding a new home. I was scared of what to find here. And then I came here and I met amazing people who just opened their doors, opened their arms. There were services available. There were people available. And yes, it was lonely because I didn't have family, but I found a home. And then my father-in-law comes to visit. And then I take him to where he says, oh, you know what? I used to know a Canadian. I'm like, you did? He's like, yeah, he was my chemistry teacher. And then he tells me this story of Ron McGraw. And then we drive up to St. Catharines. And then they start talking about Biafra War. I mean, I'd heard him talk about my husband. They can go on for hours, those two, all night, if, if, many times. But this was different. It was just not about Biafra. It was about the Canadian effort. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute. There were Canadians in Biafra. He goes, yes, I was there throughout the war. I wrote, and my, 
my letters were published in, Bia, in Canada and around the world. And I was like, wow. And from that day on, for six months, every time I'd be asleep, I'd remember Can I Relief? And I'm like, why am I? Th I'm not a documentary film. Like, I know the story has to be told, but I've never made a documentary before. And I was scared. But the more I heard about Can I Relief, I read about it, I was captivated. And then finally I said, you know what? Yes, I give in, I'll tell the story. And so the story chose me to tell it. And it was sad for me that so many Canadians had, had never even heard about it. Anyone under 60 had not even, or 50 had not even heard about the war. I was like, what, are you serious? And the more I researched, the more the story sucked me in. And it's so on brand. It's so on brand for Canada and Canadians that in spite of a lack of government support, Canadians were able to pull off one of the most remarkable things ever. Because without the Canadian effort in the joint church aid, now Canada Relief was an airline. Canadians essentially started an airline with five planes at the end. And it was almost impossible and just when Joint Church Aid, which was a larger mission, thought, oh, these Canadians, they're so lost, because they didn't know the first thing about running an airline. But even with all of the troubles, nothing stopped them. And I'll tell you that that also helped me in the making of this film, because I encountered so many obstacles. Funding, finding um, images, footage, fi research. So many travel, there were so many obstacles. But every time I thought about the trouble that the Canadians themselves faced, they lacked funding, they lacked support, they were the only members of Joint Church Aid who didn't have any government support. The Germans were funded by the German government. Irish government supported, the US government supported. All of these countries that came together were all supported by their governments except Canada. So this was just Canadians doing theirs and pulling off such a, they became such a vital role, they played such a vital role in the entire joint church aid mission that if they had shut down, people would have died. And so even when planes were shut down, Canadians kept flying. Even when the Americans said, you know what, it's too dangerous to fly, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Canadians kept flying. They were daredevils. They were such courageous people. And in the end, they began to give their money into the Canada Relief Mission. Most of them came there for the money. But when they saw what was going on, they were moved. And so it, it, it would be my joy I mean, Brian had asked me what the next step is, and I don't want to give too much away because he might ask me in the Q&A session. But there is a second phase of this project because I feel like this is going to be a life's work. The stories are too numerous to put into one film. They're too numerous to put into 10 films. There are just so many stories, and all of them speak to the amazing spirit of being Canadian. I was so proud. I did When we were told we're gonna be sworn in as Canadians. I was like, yeah, it's been a seven years coming. Yeah, it's fine. I didn't think it was going to be such an emotional ceremony until taking the oath. And there was, I could see from the video, there were so many people shedding tears and I just realized, oh my goodness, I'm shedding tears. It's the eight years, the eight years, the journey of getting to become a Canadian. It's also the journey of making this film. Everything is kind of happening at the same time where the film is finished. I'm happy to show the film, but at the same time, I'm now a part of these people who 54 years ago didn't want to sit back in their halfway across the world. They didn't have to do anything, but they wouldn't relax because they wanted to do something. And I'm proud to be Canadian, so proud. Because now I feel like when I tell the story, as I tell it as a Nigerian, I'm also telling it as a Canadian. And it's like Rick said, it's a Nigerian story, but it is such an amazing Canadian story. Because it speaks, I want my kids to grow up to know this Canada, a Canada of people who don't give up, who face obstacles, but don't give up. They laugh at their own ignorance. Oh, this is not how to do it. Well, let's find out. 
My husband always told me, the obstacle is the way. And so for every obstacle I faced making this film, I would tell myself, the obstacle is the way. And it always worked out. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's real that when you face an obstacle, you find a way around it because the only other thing would be to give up. And the Canadians didn't give up because my father-in-law survived because of Canadians. My mother survived because of the Canadians. And that's why this story chose me to tell it. It's such a personal story and I'm so passionate about it. And the images you see here, I, it's amazing when the, the trailer aired, I got a call from an old friend, a mentor. She called me and she said, you know, I was, I was one of those Biafran children, did you know? I'm like, no, she said, I was one of those children. I had kwashioko, I almost didn't make it. And I just shed tears on the phone. We just shed tears and cried together. This is waking up a new consciousness. And I'm happy that it's happening now because there is another negative consciousness. Some elements, some divisive elements trying to push for another Biafran war to happen. But the difference that they don't know is that this will never happen again. Joint Church Aid was the largest non-governmental war relief effort after the Berlin airlift, and that was military. All those allied com countries coming together with the wealth and strength and might of their military forces. This was just a group of churches doing this. The world is inundated with crises, and it is impossible to find such a group again. I'm hoping that this film will awaken that spirit of humanitarianism again. And not just to go in, this, in, in helping, in bringing relief, but a renewed dedication to conflict resolution, to prevent such conflicts from happening. Because it's not the people who decide to go to war that are ever affected. It's the man on the street, it's the woman, the pregnant woman, the old woman, it's the child who gets left behind. And nobody's coming this time because it's all over the world. Look at Ukraine. The world is gasping to keep up. They're, they're, not, they're unable to keep up with what's happening. There's Ethiopia, there's Syria, there's, there's, there's crises everywhere. And so it's important that the world remembers the importance of conflict resolution, conflict prevention, because that is the only way that the world can at least under no peace. It may be impossible in my time, but I'm, I do hope that in my children's generation that they will find a way around conflict because they will get to grow up in a world full of conflict. <laughs>